let's get more into the nitty gritty. Implicit bias. Let me read this. We are all influenced by implicit bias or stereotypes that unconsciously affect our decisions. When judging, our implicit biases may unfairly impact students. Before writing comments or making a decision, please take a moment to reflect on any biases that may impact your decision-making process. We're gonna go over speech and debate. Speech is generally considered to be easier to judge. Speech judges are usually more abundant. Debate judges are usually less abundant. And this is the primary holdup on all tournaments, the lack of available debate judges. So the main intention today is to prepare you to become comfortable with judging debate. But I will cover everything, but that's really the main intent for everyone to become comfortable judging debate. Okay, speech. First, overview. They're gonna be coming up and giving a speech. And there's generally gonna be about six or seven people and you rank those people from one to sometimes four, and then all the last place get four or one through six, depending on the tournament. And you decide who gets first, second, third, fourth, and it's that simple. But let's go into some of the events so that you have an idea of what they are about and how they're judged. Humor. Humor, and by the way, I'll send out these slides. You can access these, you can, and this actually is actually linked on the tinyyall.com CTSD judge sign up. This is our official guide, and you can read more about these events. But humor is an interpretive event just like uh, duo and drama, these are all interpretive events where people take a piece of, could be literature, it should be, has to be in print, could be a script, could be a play, could be something else that's in print, and they're generally acting it out. Humor should be funny and focuses generally on various characters that do various voices. And oftentimes it's judged on the quality of these characters, how distinct they are, their voices, ultimately, if it's funny, maybe some underlying themes and intentions behind the piece, that's humor. As far as drama, a little bit more emphasis on emotion and it's kind of like watching a 10 minute play, sometimes happy, sometimes very sad, sometimes a little bit of both. Also is one person, oftentimes also judged on the quality of characters, setting, how, can, how effectively does a person transport a, uh, you, know, you to that setting? relationships or interactions, emotions in their piece, and underlying themes. Duo is with two people, but basically the same thing as drama and humor, humor combined with two people, and that's basically inter. Poi, Pro, yeah, go ahead. One of the eyes for duo, you, the two people cannot look at each other in the eyes, they cannot make eye contact, and they cannot look at each other. If they do, it is immediately false. So if they do that, it's like immediate six or immediate four. It just depends on what's happening. Thank you, Allie. Allie, she does uh, drama and uh, is one of our students. And thank you so much. That's, an, that's a good point. Duo, you, there are rules about making eye contact. And just as she said, no direct eye contact, except during the introduction. Poi is program oral interpretation. It's where students will have a binder and they you, uh, take material from a variety of genres. And there's a lot more student, uh, almost, it's not authorship but they're cut because they're cutting text from different places. It's not authorship, but there's a lot more student agency, maybe intervention, where they're putting these pieces together. And that's one element that it distinguishes a poor. How effectively do they string together? And it could be, you know, a uh, children's story, uh, lyrics from a song, and a particular scene from a movie or a novel, or, and also oftentimes nonfiction material. And putting those together in order to have generally a central thesis, some, an idea, sometimes argumentative, and that is poi. Oratory is meant to be persuasive, usually about a societal issue. Informative, the intent is to inform and to teach. Well, not really to teach, but really just inform, inform. Sometimes, oftentimes also with a persuasive leaning, but mainly to inform. Yes, Amelia. I have a question on info. Yeah. So I judged uh, an info before. Um, one of the competitors started it with an acoustic uh, guitar and tried to sing a song. Yeah. I really liked it, so I gave her very high uh, scores. Yeah. And then I was told that this should be disqualified. So electronic devices, things that need to be plugged in specifically and arguably things that run on battery are not allowed in terms of the visuals. Info is an event where there are visuals. So you'll have like slides and boards, and, but props generally are allowed and an acoustic guitar would be considered a prop. And to my understanding of the rules, that would not be the case. 
Uh, just a quick point. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned time limit. Because... Yeah, and I'll go over all those logistics. Yeah, but you can go feel free, Norris. Oh, well, also, this is an important point. With yeah. info, then, is that info should remain almost impartial and should not really contain points of heavy emotion. That's what OO is. OO is going to have a lot more emotion embedded within it. And because we have a specific point called the heart story, it's meant to get uh, really emotional, really, either really sad or really powerful. And so with that, you would be looking for it in an OO, but in an info, you shouldn't be seeing um, such an ex excessive use of emotion. Norris is doing oratory. And so another student, thank you so much, Norris. And actually captain, he is our oratory captain, our oratory captain. Thank you, Norris. Okay, so extemp. Extemp is where they only have 30 minutes to prep. They will draw a question, choose a question, take about 15 minutes to prepare a speech, practice it for about 15 minutes, and then come in and give you the speech. And it's very oftentimes based on either politics, the economy, foreign policy, just basically what's happening in the news. When they come in, they'll give you the question. That will be natural for them. You don't need to worry. And, and how persuasive was it? Before we move on, let me just give some tips about all of these events. These are all, I just covered all the speech events. And they're generally just the same in a way for the following reasons. One is there's a time limit for all of the events. And you can always, and this is something I'll mention at the end, don't worry about the details because at the tournament, many people will be around to help you. So today, if there's anything that you take away is to not worry about the details because really there's so much help around. There's a time limit for all these. Many of them are about 10 minutes. Some of them vary, but it's generally about 10 minutes. And so oftentimes you'll want to take, do a stopwatch. And when your stopwatch says seven minutes, you hold up a three to uh, say three minutes left, a two for two minutes left, one, 30 seconds, and time signals vary amongst people. And then oftentimes a fist at the, t at the deadline. And there's a grace period. So let's say my timer has hit 10, 10, 10 minutes. It's 10 minutes. They keep going. That's okay. At 1030, the grace period is over. And by rule, they are to be verbally stopped. So again, you count down, the time limit is 10 minutes. There's a 30 second grace period. And at 1030, you verbally stop them. And by rule, the person, if a person reaches that grace period, they cannot place first in the round. They can place second, but they cannot place first. Well, if they exceed it, not if they, if they, if they're within the 1030, they're fine. If they're within the 1030, they're fine. If they are at or above 1030, now, whether or not 1030 is included in that, I might have to go back to the rules, but certainly if you are required to verbally stop them or they've, they've hit 1030, they cannot get first in the round. I also just wanted to add what you're saying that timetables will vary between different people. It really doesn't do that. Like, I have different timetables and same yours. Like, my time signals are always like 5, 3, 2, 1, 10, 30, and then stop. And so always ask them before you start them because not only does it show like, oh, but they actually, like, they're trying to actually judge instead of just hiring here because I was told to. It's a, okay, they're actually, they're trying to make sure that I succeed because I put in the work. And when you're asking them what the time signals are, it not only just kind of creates like a, oh, like I actually care, but it just makes it a lot easier for the competitor. It'll ease nerves and for novices, for like the people who have just been starting, it'll make it seem like, okay, like I actually, I thought this, like I know what I'm doing, they're gonna give me time signals, it'll be okay. And if you don't know how to do time signals, you can always ask them. I have two, two questions. Are students allowed to look at the stop, their stopwatch? No. So there's one event in which you will see students time themselves on the speech side, and that's extemp. They generally will have a, a phone. They might put it on a desk. It doesn't always happen. Oftentimes, students will rely on the judge's time signals. Lakshmi does extemp for us. It's actually, she's an novice, so she's learning about extemp. It's probably, you're probably going to learn a ton from this, am I right? Because when students learn about judging, they actually become better competitors. So, uh, but... Essentially, yeah, you might time yourself in extent, and that's generally not against rules. And in general, you will not see students time themselves in speech. They will be relying on time signals. And having a watch or phone would generally detract from their performance, generally detract from their speech, and the nature of speech, which is generally memorized and all about performing and engaging, you're not, students are not going to be timing themselves. So my second question is that are there any events in speech that would allow students to read from scripts? Okay, great question. I'll have to refresh my memory, but essentially, early in the season, let's just describe the norm. Early in the season, first couple tournaments, you're going to have people on script. They're going to be reading off. That's okay. By the time we get to state or like the very high stakes tournaments, they generally shouldn't be on, on script. And there are rules that prohibit a person from ranking first or something to that effect if they are on script, especially at the state and national qualifying tournament. What they said it was you, if you have a script and it's at a varsity tournament, you cannot be placed higher than fourth. And early in the season, and okay, so yeah, and keep in mind that invitational tournaments, which are just like the regular tournaments during the year, they actually have their tournament specific rules. Sometimes they'll say, oh, we go by the state rules or we go by the national rules. And those rules may have things explicitly related to script, but 
Um, right now, I don't, I can't clarify exactly. I'm pretty sure that at the state level, national qualifying level, there is a rule exactly what Norris has described. Whether or not it's enforced or applied, especially early in the season, kind of varies. You're probably going to use that as a basis for judgment, and that is okay. You see two people, and they're equal competitors, but one's on script, okay to judge on that basis. Probably would not give a person who's on script the one. That might be, um, you know, but it could just be your call. And you can ask people about that before you submit your decisions. Um, some things that, so I judge policy tournaments before, and something that I always do is if someone has a script, like I've had people read off their computers, um, you always, like, this might just be like a me thing, but I always ask to see the script after the event, just to make sure they're not, like, mostly for speech tournaments, just to make sure they're not having multiple different pieces, they're not essentially cheating, they're not rewriting different things, because I've noticed that, especially at the beginning of the season, I mean, kids are just trying to figure it out, they're trying to figure out how speech works, what the different rules are, how they can succeed without, you know, kids are, kids are kids, and we try to get corners sometimes because we're just fancy like that. And so I think it's one of those things where you guys do, but something that I've always learned is if you just look over the script, just look at the quick little like flip through, it tends to be like, oh, like, okay, they're, they're serious, they're real about this, like they want to make sure that this is a fair tournament. And like, I don't know, that just might be me, but um, that's something that I've noticed. And then something else is when you're judging um, speech, I know you said it's one of the easier tournaments to judge, which is true, it is a lot easier to judge than um, debate, but it's also like, I was nationals last year, like this is a big part of my life, so don't, I don't know, I just, I'm saying like take that with a little bit of a grain of salt just because this is like his entire, like this is my entire life currently. So when you're putting those numbers in, don't put it in and be like, oh, mm, that one's a little bit better. Like think about like a little different things. And if you have to look back at this stuff, like look back at it, nobody's gonna be like, oh, I cannot believe you have to look back at the rules. Like nobody really cares. But just make sure that you're looking back at the rules. And if you have to ask, if you have to ask one of the students what different things are, um, I don't think you can, can you place, um, like ballots and stuff after you've left the room, you have to do that in the room. No, you can leave the room and submit decisions. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, but just ask somebody if you don't know. So. And there's one thing that as far as comments, we will, there's a section here where I'm going to talk about the kind of feedback that you should uh, provide. I'm pretty sure, but constructive and, uh, you know, some good, some things to work on, some more good, you know, sort of general feedback type approaches, which not everyone's used to that, but it's basically that's that, like some good, some constructive, some good. Okay. Before we move on, that's actually all of speech. Talk about Lincoln Douglas. It's one-on-one. -on -one and it's a value-oriented debate. The what's right, what's wrong. Public forum is a two-on-two -two debate, and it's usually more uh, sort of the most accessible, the most sort of topic straight from the headlines, and a little bit less technical, and it's two-on-two. -two. Policy is the oldest form of debate. It's two-on-two. -two. It is the longest form of debate, and often it is the most technical form of debate. So there's some features that you might see. Clarity in the structure of their case. So as John is saying, a point, and they, that point has to be clear. And, it's, and if, ultimately, if you don't understand it, that's not good for the debater. And whether or not you understand something is the primary goal for the debater for, for the, to persuade the judge. So really, ultimately, it's all about you. So what, if you don't understand something, then that's not good for the debater. Clarity. Can you follow the case? That's one. Second is evidence. Do they have uh, reliable, well-substantiated, well-qualified, well-credentialed evidence to support what they're saying? And do they explain their thinking? Ultimately, that's pretty much what it comes down to. In terms of the case, do they explain their thinking? Yeah. So in the case of a value debate, could the, could the um, I, I, I don't know which one goes first, the affirmative or the negative, I assume the affirmative person would. For, can I answer that real quick? Lincoln Douglas, the affirmative always goes first. It's a it's a set format. Public forum, they flip a coin, and a per, uh, this team can choose either to go affirmative or negative, or first or second. It's almost like in football, where you either choose a kick or receive, and the other team chooses which side to defend. It's basically the same thing. So I might choose to go affirmative, or I might choose to go second, and I'll let the other people choose. So my question is, could, could they, in the value debate, could the negative uh, debater simply just talk, uh, I guess attack the values of the they could just I mean, not have the value itself yeah not have a predetermined why this is negative just direct his or her energy at why that why their values are incorrect let me first say what can and cannot the debater do the debater can do whatever they want there are rules and we're going to cover some of the rules but generally they can do whatever they want they can make any arguments that they want generally we i would not coach my students to attack values necessarily because actually to directly compare values is often very difficult. To say, what is more important? Is it saving lives or is it truth? Is it uh, you know, economic growth or the environment? The value itself oftentimes is very hard to uh, compare. And really where most of the attacks come are how well does their case actually support their value? Maybe 
you uh, determine which value or criterion is more appropriate given the resolution or more appropriate given the issues discussed. But very rarely I would I have uh, one of our students say, oh, well, my value is better because, and unless they are making an argument basically related to the resolution and the ideas discussed in the round in the cases, not just a straight line comparison, morality is better than truth, et cetera. Are they going into this? Pre-prepared. For, the, for their case. But once the round starts, it's all, it's all novel. They know what the resolution is. They know what the resolution is. Right. They'll have both sides prepared. Oh, okay. So they go into it knowing both sides. That's right. Okay. How should you actually judge? Well, this is probably the most important concept. Debaters will refer to as flowing the round. It's the note taking associated with following the round. And some people, it's referred to as the flow. And the way that this is traditionally done and how we teach our students is that there is an affirmative flow. You flow the affirmative case, and then you, on a separate sheet of paper, you flow the negative case. So there are two competing cases. Quick practical thing is that we generally want to do that in a very narrow way and with two different colors. The reason is, is because so that we can take notes for all the successive speeches that follow and the colors help us to follow along with who said what. Okay. On this flow, let's say we flow the affirmative case and they're making a case about uh, fossil fuel extraction. Well, when the negative will give their case, we flow that here. But when they go to the rebuttal, so I'm a negative, I give my case why you shouldn't prohibit fossil fuel extraction, maybe instead do X, Y, Z. I might give arguments against the affirmative, but specifically against what the affirmative said to try to sort of disentangle or disrupt the thinking or, or point out flaws in the thinking of the opposing side. That's really what it's about. And I put that information, I would flow that against the affirmative case. Said another way, if the negative person is speaking, in this case, I'm using a black pen. I flow the negative case. And when they start attacking the affirmative case, I still use that black pen because that black pen is the negative speaker. And I will put that against the affirmative case. Once you start doing this, it becomes a lot more clear. Your first time, just take notes, okay? And the reason why I put it this way is it gives, here's how you conceptualize a round. It's two competing cases. I can prove my case and disprove my opponent's case or vice versa. It's two competing cases. Very rare, and instead of on one sheet of paper, just people saying things back and forth, if you distinguish the affirmative and negative case, things become a lot easier to judge. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yes, generally. If they're experienced and they're familiar with what they're doing. What's that? Mm -mm. The students should also be doing this. And I'll tell you right now, for any of you who have students in, in debate, it's the number, one of the first foundational skills that actually students struggle a lot on. And it's probably the primary thing that will bring them more success because they can more easily conceptualize what's happening in the round. And you can too, when you are judging you'll be able to keep track of what's going on. So encourage them to really get this down. Um, are you allowed or should you um, show this to the debaters after the debate? Generally not, okay. no. And the amount that, that's what we call a disclosure. The amount that you disclose generally is very little. And oftentimes, most of the time, we ask that judges do not disclose their decision. In certain terms, in certain places, they do. And they explain the rationale for their decision. You can talk about it. But in general, we'll say as a, as a general rule, do not disclose. It just slows things down is the main thing. And just a clarification, that's not uh, specific to debate. That's with any event you judge. That's right. You're not supposed to communicate with uh, any of your competitors before or after round. And hypothetically, it, it can happen, but try to avoid it, especially if they, they ask you questions regarding any feedback or any sort of thing regarding scoring. You, you try your best to keep it secret. So two cases, two colors of pins, and you just make sure you use the right pin for the right speaker, the right side, and they should direct you where to flow. This is the last thing I'll say about this. Look, they should tell you I am now giving arguments on the affirmative flow. And now I'm moving to the negative flow. And they should almost like holding your hand and with the pen in your hand, you write down this argument. This is what, that's how clear they should be. They should guide you through. And if they don't, that's on them. There's a conflict about the rules. If somebody, uh, if you need like outside help from the tab room, the people running the tournament, and a side claims that there's a violation of the rules and you bring in outside help and it's found that there was a violation, the other team gets disqualified. If there wasn't a violation, they get disqualified. In general, bringing in outside help like that is strongly discouraged, and you should have the debaters, to the best of their extent, just resolve it in round. And if you are really not sure, just go to tab after the round, clarify, then submit your decision. 
or have your decision prepared or just submit it because we can always change it in tab. Submit your decision and then go ask. We can always help and clarify after the fact. Things generally should be resolved in the round. If it really comes down to it and they bring in outside help, then they should know that that's the consequence. 100%.